Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the BSHS Digital History of Science Festival 2023. My name is Sam Robinson. I'm the chair of BSHS Conferences, and it is my great pleasure this morning, still morning in the UK, to introduce, uh, to welcome you to this session on history of science in the age uh, of Web 3.0. Uh, and without any uh, further delay, I'm going to hand over to Jeannie, who's going to get us all started. So over to you. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. As you have seen from the abstract, our panel today is about history of science and, and the Web3. Over the past couple of years, we have seen a massive surge of what we call Web3, including the rise and fall of Bitcoin, the emergence of Metaverse, and the emergence of ChatGPT, or now GPT-4. And today in this short little session, we're going to experimentally talk about how historians of science, as well as from other disciplines, could handle the situation. How can we approach it as a researcher? And how can we think about it as a user or a developer of the technology? And how can we use this opportunity to make our academia better? Our session will include three parts. The first of them is a video, or what we call video essay. The second of them is a map. And the third of them is a demonstration of a website, which is built by all our panelists together. Now I will start introducing our first speaker, uh, Xu Lu, who is a PhD candidate in literature studies at Sichuan University. Hi, Xu Lu. Hi. And she's now doing a PhD project around the concept of surface and how surface is embodied in both literature practices and in scientific discourses. If you have heard about the surface turn in the recent years, that's what she is working on. And more broadly, she's also interested in open source and digital libraries and in game design and, and artistic research. And today she's going to present a video essay called about chat GPT and how we should stop worrying about it. So now I will play Shilu's video from my screen and afterwards Shilu will say hi to all of us. Okay, now I am sharing. Can you all see this?
We came across the story of a blues man from the 1930s, a guy called Robert Johnson. Now, the story goes that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in the Deep South. He sold his soul, and in return, he was given the secret of a black technology, a black secret technology that we know to be now as the blues. The blues begat jazz. The blues begat soul. The blues begat hip hop. The blues begat R&B. Now, flash forward 200 years into the future. Next figure, another hoodlum, another bad boy scavenger poet figure. He's called a data thief. 200 years into the future, the data thief has told a story. If you can find the crossroads, a crossroads, this crossroads, if you can make an archaeological dig into this crossroads, you'll find fragments, techno fossils, and if you can put those elements, those fragments together, you'll find the code. Crack that code and you'll have the keys to your future. You've got one clue and it's a phrase, mothership connection.
Hi, welcome back. Thank you so much, Lu, for sharing this video with us and for sincerely sharing all your worries and the many doubts about ChatGPT, which I believe we all have. Can you tell us a bit more about how did you come up with this video idea? Okay, thanks. Oh, thank you for watching. Um, this research initially began with a feminine feeling ChatGPT brings to me when I first used it in the March, in hopes, in hopes of I had described and described the errors, accidents, failures, and some reddens in the research process. Mm, I think the results was made of made of by some accidents and some chance and uh, hope you all like it. And I will, I plan to perfecting, perfecting it in the future. If you or if you have some questions, free, free, feel free to let me know and I will um, reply by the text. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Lu. If you have any questions about Lu's video, please feel free to put it in the Q&A panel of this chat. Now let's welcome our second speaker, Yu Xin, who is a PhD student in Science and Technology Studies, STS, at Cornell University. And her current research focuses on labor and environmental issues in computing infrastructures. She's very curious about people's alternative technological solutions and imaginaries beyond the designer's intentions. She also has a broad interest in anthropology, human-computer interaction, and media studies. And today, she's going to bring us with an interesting map about the Bitcoin mining infrastructures in China. Yuxin, the floor is yours. Hi, hi. Welcome to our panel. And I will start my screen share. Okay. Okay, how to view. Uh, yeah, my the title of my presentation it's a historical atlas of the infrastructures of Web three. Okay, let's start by two pictures. Well, uh, these photos documented local Tibetan villagers working in a Bitcoin mining facility, and their hand woven bamboo baskets carrying the infrastructure of the modern crypto economy. 
In early May 2021, at the rainy season approached in the mountains of the southwestern China, a group of Tibetan villagers gathered near a fleet of trucks to unload mining machines, wares, and other equipment, carrying them into flat buildings clustered around an electrical electric substation. They participate in the global capitalism in the old way of gathering crops. Surprisingly, the sophisticated digital currency infrastructure of the Web3 era still relies on primary manual labor to keep it running on practical level. Uh, and this map shows that how the... Okay, so... Okay, uh, there's some issue in my computer, so I can't... Um, Okay, never mind. Yeah, as these three maps shows in 2018 to 2029, a group of crypto nomads moved from northwestern in winter and spring to southwestern in summer and autumn, just as their ancestors had done. But instead of fresh grass, they follow the seasonal rhythms of electricity rates from spring hydroelectrical floods in the mountain to the winter winds on the plain. Uh, well, at the same time, Bitcoin's price has doubled since the beginning of 2021. Various cryptocurrencies have also risen fueled by the concepts such as NFT and metaverse and also Web3, and this uh, raising attracts a large number of speculators and opportunities. But I found it very surprising because um, these people uh, and the villagers who work in the mining sites, they are in a state of mutual unknowing. They didn't know about each other. But as we can see from these photos, uh, the cryptocurrency money system that seems to op operate automatically is also in a, compl a complex historical network of labor. So this project is tend to investigate the various non eliminable material and labor intermediaries, inter intermediaries in uh, in this um, this intermediate digital currency system to make the hidden system visible. Yeah, I use Atlas as a metaphor here. It's a way to try to uh, look at systems from different perspectives and skills. So I guess we can first zoom out a little bit to see the Okay, it works. Okay, as a problems tend to rely uh, when when we talk about becoming all uh bit blockchain, they tend to rely on labels such as decentralization and transparency and also this removing middleman. Uh, yeah, the, these concepts have already prom promoted to the public by using a lot of venture capital, academic resources and media interest. So yeah. Uh, looking back into the history, cryptocurrencies are the crisp, uh, crisp, uh, crystallization of the convergence of crypto, uh, cryptography, computer science, economics, and other disciplines born out of utopian and uh, um, yeah, and this, this, this 
um, social concepts. But yeah, the origins of this kind of speculative currencies can be traced back at least to the Great Depression in the United States in the 1920s. And also, um, it also has some relation with the technocracy movement and the cyberpunk movement. Yeah, a common principle emerges from technocracy, crypto punk, and cryptocurrencies is that trust the code, not the agent. But it some somehow though that's what we with what we have so, uh, seen before. It has there is a lot of intermediaries in these systems. So uh, let's zoom in on specific locations. Okay, just. Uh, yeah, and to see how the system interact with the environment uh, and how the environment supports the operation of mining machine and the, the relationship between the computing power and the more traditional process of results, extraction, exchange, management, and consumption. Uh, yeah, and yeah, in the 1920s, 13, some money size emerged in China. Okay, let me uh, turn to my interactive map. Okay, yes. I have marked some points in the map and uh, the, the first point is in Shenzhen and uh, uh, Guangdong in Shenzhen, Guangdong province. And yeah, the in 2013, some mining sites emerged in China's most developed Southeast coast. Especially in 2014, the Bitcoin market uh, is very blue, blue. And to some, uh, some mining manufacturers, they start to mining themselves. And when mining went to scale up and industrialization, the difference in electricity costs of a few cents tend into a huge cost of differential. So they uh, generally abandoned this area because it's too expensive and they came to orders. It is a city in uh, North. China, yeah, uh, to some miners, they uh, they want to chase cheap electricity and uh, policies. So they uh, moved their mines to Inner Mongolia. And this city is famous for its rich coal reserves. Inner Mongolia became one of the earliest mining bases in the 2014, and uh, yeah, it is the number one co producing city in Inner Mongolia. And yeah, cloud computing and big data industrial was considered to can save this city in the future. Uh, this is a picture of um, locally called Dala, um, Dallas. Su economic development zone relies on um, it is one of the biggest Bitcoin farms in the world. These eight factory buildings with blue roofs account for nearly 1% of the total number of far, uh, Bitcoin minings in the world. It counts to uh, three sixteen percent of the computing power at that time. Yeah, and uh, similar to Inner Mongolia, it's Xinjiang. It has also has rich coal reservation. Okay, it's here. And yeah, the high mountain valley area in Xinjiang and also some frontiers, they have extremely cheap electricity. Yeah, but um, 
the massive consumption of fossil energy that cryptocurrency means has caused widespread concern in society, and the government has begun to restrict the activities of mines. So um, at the same time, these miners move to Sichuan province. They want to use a cheap and clean hydropower as a uh, well, this point didn't show in this picture. Okay. At least I have pictures in my slides. Okay, it's here. Uh, we can, uh, yes, it's famous for a small um, hydropower plants and because of the seasonal rhythms of hydropower. Uh, sorry, uh, where's, okay. Uh, this is a picture of the Bitcoin mining stations in this area. Um, well, yeah, uh, most of these places are economically backward and so it's hard for them to attract high-tech entrepreneurs to enter into this uh, region. But Bitcoin mines can consume millions of uh, kilowatts of electricity a day without industrial waste of discharge and can also increase local tax revenue, making them the best customers for surplus hydropower consumption during the water season the marginal cost of electricity from hydropower plants is quite low and maybe close to zero. Yeah, but they have to do a lot of works to um, deal with the noise and heat because the product of mining is not only trust, but also noise and heat. So on the official website of Bitmine, the large producer of mining machines, and the, these pictures are from their website and they do and um, these images give us a view and um, of environmental conservation and cleanliness at uh, the environment it's able to natural naturally cool down the miners mm, but as we seen before we saw before the mining sites do not seem to locate it in cold and stable climates the location of the mine sites there has large temporary differences between day and night. So it makes it very difficult for the data center to use nature temperatures to cool the machines. So they have to do a lot of measures such as, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot of measures to cool down the machines and also keep the electricity in a very low price. So it came, um, yeah. Uh, and then I move on from the geographical uh, geographic map to a historical map. Uh, so it is why I called it Atlas, because there is various map here. Mm. And I also would like to draw a historical hydropower map related to it because of the surplus electricity was not only caused by the natural resources, but caused by the uh, dam building, the historical dam building. The choice of location is not um, just accidental, but a product of the long-term social, political, and environmental history and people. So yeah. I I think maybe in some way the story of Bitcoin mining is not only a story of how these uh, how these mining factories flexibly use the these resources and infrastructures, but also a story of how infrastructures have been rep repurposed in placating over fifty years of Chinese. Uh, hydropower history. Yeah. 
Okay, it is. Uh, sorry, my computer is somehow. Okay, it's here. So yeah, uh, in during my archive work, I found that providing energy for this um, cryptocurrency mines uh, are small hydropower plants in the southwest. This small hydropower is a relatively uh, concept because in contrast to large dams, small hydropower is a distributed energy source that combines electricity generation, supply and consumption, and is built and managed by local organizations. So they have more freedom to do what they want. Yeah, uh, yeah, these, these dams, they are served for different purpose. They are served for social transformation, uh, especially in the 20, 1950s. But then they just became the batteries of crypto mining. I would like to know how this happened and what is a Chinese version of crypto, of um, technocracy or um, cyberpunk. Yeah, so yeah, attempts to transform the world with a certain idea have been made throughout human history. Uh, people are constantly trying to transform the world with some ideas. Uh, blockchain, maybe just one of them, with the help of cryptography principles, blockchain has tried uh, to create um, decentralized and uh, uh, transparency digital world but when this vision is um, it's turned into re reality it inevitably bound up with the various infrastructures and uh, yeah cryptocurrency mines are the anchor points through which the crypto world connect to the real world so yeah, I want to make an atlas of all these principles, which means that uh, we can see how these interactives, uh, we can map the intermediate and see how these things interact with each other. Yeah, so yeah, this is my project. I'm still in an early stage. That's wonderful. Thank you, Yuxin, for sharing with us this rich map, which brings us from the north to the south and from the west to the east and lead us through the development of blockchain infrastructure in China and beyond. Um, the last presentation, well, um, it's from me and Minke, and we will bring us a website demonstration of the history of science library that is founded by all of us. I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Uh, I'm into digital stuff, although my PhD project, which is on early modern science and medicine, was a weird idea called Doctrine of Signatures during the 16th and 17th century. It has nothing to do about anything about on Web3, unless you see the world lose PhD projects. And Minke, who will present together with us, is our website designer who has a background in psychology and is interested in creating artifacts that incorporate contextual knowledge and encourage creat creative ways of use. Currently, she works for an XR company where she designs the UX for AR products and games. And in her personal ex practice, she's not limited to any particular medium, and she always enjoys exploring new ways of expressing ideas and craft experiences. The website design of our library is basically wholly made by Minke, which all of us are grateful for. And now let's uh, let's start. So I will begin with a slight presentation, introducing us to, through the backgrounds, and then we will enter the 
uh, website demo stage. And afterwards, I will talk a little bit about how our library would develop in the age of Web3. So now I will share my screen first. Oops, no, no, no. Now, a little spoiler, but that's fine. Okay, uh, I hope you can all see it now. My talk today is about history of science library reimagining institutions with Web3. And to begin with, I'll tell you a bit about the story um, behind the foundation of our project. This library that we built online is inspired by the Warble Library in London, which I believe many of you have been visiting, which is a unique library where you can simply, uh, like what I'm showing in the middle picture, take out take off early modern books from the shelf, just a side of the modern books. And the best thing of the library is that it has a unique system of classification that doesn't arrange the books simply by numbers or alphabet, but by it seems the, uh, the uh, the ground floor, the reading room is reference works. The first floor is about image. The second floor is all the books about word. The third floor about orientation and the fourth floor about action. And inspired by this library in 2020 during the COVID, where I believe we all feel the, a sudden uh, lack in our world of the access to physical libraries, I came up with the idea of founding a digital library online with Zotero. What I wanted to do is, uh, is to create a library with a classification system as unique as the variable libraries and serve as a resource, um, a resource hub and a research tool, not only for myself, but also for others. In my library, I built it also according to the floor system. There is the first floor about historiography, bibliographies, and all kinds of intellectual resources. The second floor about the objects and the questions in the history of science today. For example, practices, images, as well as surfaces, and the scientific instruments, spaces, scientists, societies, and so on. And the third floor, I classified it with disciplines, including mass experimental science, occult knowledge, celestial, celestial knowledge, and so on. We will see it later in the demo as well. And in each, uh, in each unit of the classification system, it is further separated down to many levels. For example, in the level of terrestrial science, I have a collection of sources, some sources about cartography, and about knowledge, visuality, making maps, medieval, early modern mapping, although we can see that several categories are lacking. For example, where is ancient or modern mapping going in this? And maps and colonization and semantic mapping. This is never a fixated system, of course, as you can see, and it's always subject to expansion and development. Nowadays, the library is online. You can see it on Zotero, simply searching history of science library. And we can see that nowadays it already has more than 300 users and more than 26,000 items. It would take some time to go through all of them one by one. And not only that, in this library, uh, I mean, afterwards, with the help of um, not only me, but many other peers, including all of us here in the panel today, we expanded our library to include not only a reference system on Zotero, but also a special collections. Like here is on Omeka about all the digitized antiquarian books, rare books and manuscripts that I personally collected. It's pretty rare for collectors to be willing to digitize all of their items, I believe. Yeah, but here you can see everything simply from online. And we have also developed databases on Notion. Here I have put here the database of e-resources and online exhibitions that we simply collect all together with a cross-sourcing method. 
and we share it with everyone. And we also have our blog, our website, and social media. That's how our library is look, looks like today. By uh, building this library, we are looking at not only history of science, but also an intersection as the theme of our BSHS suggests, intersection of many disciplines. It includes not only historical, but also present materials, for example, knowledge from the STS discipline, from the media studies, and, the, and contemporary art studies sometimes, and so on. And we invite not only empirical historical methods, but also speculative methods, for example, artistic research, like what Lu has been presenting in her video, is an important theme for our library. And by building this library, our initial intention is to bridge the knowledge gap between China, which most of our library editors are based at, and other parts of the world. Because of the language difference, there has been a, maybe we are all aware, there has been a huge gap between how much knowledge you can acquire in English and in many other languages. Uh, not only a uh, European language like German, French, but also other language like in, in Chinese and so on. And this has um, each plays a significant role in limiting the access of scholars in China to global resources and what's happening in the global academia. So sort of what we are doing here is to create a library which can be assessed assessed and popularized by uh, both Western and non-Western academia in an attempt to bridge the gap. Here I have collected some testimonies from the users of our library, which I have translated into English. Some, some people who have read our library were inspired to create another research, research database, another library herself on German history. And some people get uh, notice the graduate programs and different kind of fellowships we are sharing on our website and apply to the graduate program and uh, admit it to it. Here is a thank you message that we received from our backstage. And there are also many messages about how our how we are creating a free database to bridge the information and knowledge gap and how our bibliography classification uh, serves as positive tools to inspire people to learn and build their own knowledge systems. So now we will enter a short web website demo and I will hand over to Minke who will walk us through our website design and all the resource databases we've created. Minke, yes, you can share you. your screen now. Thank you, CE, and oh, okay. Since you're still sharing, let, let me just share my screen directly. Hmm. And um, technical issue. Yes, I'm trying to share my browser. Can you see it? Um, Perhaps. Let me do it one more time, sorry. Right. Is it coming up? And um, it's all black now. Oh, let me share my whole screen instead. <laughs> sorry. And Um, how about now? Like a yeah, blank can see the screen. Desktop. And where's my browser? <laughs> Sorry. Give me my, one moment. Um, can you see a, like a black browsers mm, right yeah. now? Okay. Um, so <laughs> Sorry about what just happened. And thank you, Sinyi, for the introduction. 
And hello, everyone. My name is Mingke. And as Xin introduced, I'm the designer and also uh, the, uh, the maker behind the website. Uh, and today, I'm really thrilled to present the new website with Xin together. And actually, this is the first public appearance of our new website. And in fact, it's still in the making. So there's still contents to be filled and glitches, bugs to fix. But we feel it's a pretty good opportunity to, to show it around the history of science community right now to get some feedbacks and um, discuss some questions, pro any problem. So just don't hesitate to post them if you have any in the q &A panel right now. And without further ado, let's jump into that. Um, so let's go to the website, uh, hist, hist And firstly, you will see this uh, big like portal, like abstract stuff will come as. Uh, so it's like suggesting there's something hidden, something larger hidden behind, and we can click enter together. <laughs> And if you take, take us to the map, it is one of the things that we value the most uh, for our library. So because it's not just uh, so because it not just show what we have, what we host, but also the ways uh, we see and classify our collections. And this page is intended to be real from the bottom. There's still um bags here. And uh, so you can we, we can see this portal again and also there are some like branches burgeoning from it and each of these represents a floor in our virtual library and there are also some floating things like outside this tree like this special collections and also our databases um and see would you like to walk us uh walk us through it uh yes uh you can scroll it to the bottom Inke. yeah as we can see, the library is intended to be as a physical place, a virtual physical place where you can enter. So at the end, there was a door. And from the door, you can enter the ground floor, which is called training. This is basically training resources about different kind of sources or skill sets you need to be a historian of science. For example, you can find some language tutorials in this section, and you can find they uh, find some handbooks on paleography, for example, and handbooks on writing, on digital humanities. All those kind of resources are collected in the Zotero database of this level. Okay. And okay. from this place, yeah, you can click, if you click enter the floor. Mm, so it takes okay, some time. But this will bring us to the Ta-da, the Doterra library, which you can just open. Very floor languages, manuscript and rare books. They will probably take some time to load, but you can explore it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Some, some folder may seem empty at the first set, but if you go deeper, there will be. <laughs> yeah, you just need to <laughs> open the folder and wait for some time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we can, we can go back. Okay, we can go back to the first floor, which is about resources and intellectual resources. It collects basically two things. One is the historiographical material. Basically, what, pre uh, what previous historians of science, I mean, since the age of George Sutton probably have been doing, and their, their archival resources and the studies on the historiography. And then from 1.1 to 1.9, there is a huge collection about all kinds of resources and methodological resources that you can find. Institutions, museums, libraries, journals, that's basically all the link to there. Um, yeah. Note that this library is mainly intended for, uh, initially for Chinese readers to learn more about the Western academia and get their way through research in English. So our collection is also shaped, shaped in this way. And this, uh, the second floor, yes. 
It's about objects and questions, as I mentioned. That we may, we may call scientific image or scientific instrument, some object or some question that we can study in the discipline of history of science. And if we enter the floor. Yeah. Yes. I'll just go from here. Mm. Yeah. Yes. You can see. And if you open, for example, scientific image, this section, and see that's classified according to uh, according to a visual series, different level of scientific images, scene, representation, picture, symbol, sign, and text, or imagination. That could all be topics in scientific images. And if you, if you click through 2.5, Scientists. Uh, 2.5. Uh, 2. Uh, later, yes. <laughs> you can see all kinds. That's basically, you know, something stemmed from my own research in the early modern Europe. But when you collect uh, through one section, for example, that's a random one, like mm -hmm. the 1600. Um, yeah. yeah. You oh. will see all kinds of people. Um, arranged alphabetically in the 16th, who are who could be considered scientists in the 1600 Europe. That's not. Um, it doesn't mean only the normal category of scientists like Newton, but also it includes many domestic practitioners and artisans. That's it about the structure of the second floor. Now we can move to the third floor as well, the history of disciplines, which is a more Warburgian floor. If you click enter, you will see resources from different uh, disciplines, as I mentioned. And Yep, mathematics, geometry, and you can collect the six collected knowledge sample, which includes natural history in general, pharmacy, mineralogy, zoology, anthropology. Yeah, that's the library, library structure. Can we go back? Yeah, we can go back. Okay. And there is the fourth form of history of techniques is still in development. And apart from this doctoral library, we also have our databases, which contains a database of regular summary of or updates of what's new, what's happening in academia. For example, we can click through the new uh, e-resources yeah. list. Ooh, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't have update this link. Uh, no worries. But... Here's another one here. Mm. Sorry, just. It looks like this. Yeah. You may know that Notion has a very convenient uh, web clipper on the Chrome browser, which allows you to add different links into the database by one click. This is what. Uh, our editors in the library have been collecting over the past uh, past one or two years. We have classified all kinds of resources like projects, multimedia resources and exhibitions, etc., and we label them according to their themes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there are different views. Yeah, from which you can, yeah simply filter by the scenes. And by using Notion, we allow different users to subscribe to our database and join it very easily. So now on Notion, we have a number of collaborators who subscribe and can see our database. And on the moment, they're updated, and they can also add the things themselves. And yeah. You can also go to see the CFP and the CFA. This is a collection of the call for papers 
that we can randomly see online. You may be aware that Twitter or Facebook are not allowed in China. And that's why a lot of information like this, this kind of timed information, they do not reach Chinese audience uh, directly. That's why we created this database to allow people who have this kind of need to easily assess them. For example, if somebody uh, like me who are based outside mainland China has this kind of information database, then some people from, from Twitter or et cetera, then some other people who are working in who are working in China can simply assess them. That's how this is designed. Okay, we can go back. Okay. Hmm. Do you like want to talk about the special collections we left it yeah. here? Or, or I can continue. You can do the collections, yeah. Yes, here is the special collection database that we have. It is based on Omeka, which is a software used by many archives and libraries as well. You can simply collect to, for example, the featured item. Yep, here. That's basically a book that I collected from eBay. And here is the digitized image of it. You can see that it's, it's an 18th century almanac containing a lot of annotations and memoranda, and even with made in pockets, oh, and bills in them. Mm, I have been collecting rare books since uh, two years ago, and my object is to digitize every one of the items I have ever owned. Some of them are still in progress. Some of them don't have every image included, but we are working on it. Okay, we can go back to the main page and... Okay, so... Yeah, probably go through a bit. Yeah, with the blog part or... Yeah. And our okay. team member, yeah. Okay, so after this map, we can freely like go through, click through this main menu, and so how about just follow the sequence? Mm -hmm. uh, the collections page uh, is actually, I, for me, is like a more detailed textual version of the map that we talk about. Uh, like we explain explain more about what we have. And from the special collections up front, then our main collection, and finally the four notion databases. And firstly, some overview and the library map again, because it's very important to us. And some information on the special collections. And there are the two uh, the same links with uh, with the ones in the map. And and then for the main collections, we run last link to the library map. And also we are planning to put up some uh, articles about to introduce more about our classification system. And also there are some uh, creative projects we are going, we are having, but uh, not public yet. And finally for the four notion databases that you can also view from here. And so we also create these illustrative covers here to uh, highlight this, these uh, featured contents. And th those are made by my friend, Yang Liu. She may not be here, <laughs> maybe, maybe sleeping right now because <laughs> she's in the US. Um, and next is the learning page. Um, so after knowing what we have, what we host, uh, um, the, this page shows shows the ways and tools that we provide you um, to tell you what you can do with us, what you can do with our collections. But right now, as you can see, it's still in its early stage that there's more contents coming up. Right now, we only have our, a Chinese version user get here, <laughs> but uh, you, you can also auto-translate that. I'm sorry about that just for the moment, but we will uh, put, put those online like, in the following months. And next we can go to the blog page. 
um, so be, besides from collecting things, uh, we also read articles and did interviews and uh, published newsletters. Uh, but we started that, as seen talk about, we uh, the library was intended to like um, communicate with the Chinese um, students at first, but uh, and, and also the those th these articles essays were first published on our WeChat official platform, and that's essentially a, a our blog in Chinese, but only live in the WeChat platform, not in the larger internet. So right now we are planning to migrate many of those articles to this website so everybody can see it. Uh, and also we are translating some of the very, uh, very nice ones that some featured articles we like to a lot. For example, here's one uh, on the lab fe fever <laughs> phenomena that's written by Lu Xu, who just presented the video <laughs> at the beginning. And it's a pretty interesting read that you can, you may, if you have interest, you can do it afterwards. And finally is the about page. So there are like more info about the projects and the team behind. And if you wanna see us or reach us after this session, you know where to go. Yeah, and there's also some pictures, images of us in this on this page and some detailed intro. Yeah, and that's pretty much of this website. It's the debut of our uh, new History of Science Library website, and I will hand it over back to Sini. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Yunke. So now we have a couple of minutes left. I will use this couple of minutes to try to tell you even a little bit about our visions beyond this website. Oops, uh, uh, So now, as we have already seen, it's as a, what we have built is a huge reference library with different branches of uh, expertise from special collections to motion databases. And the question here I want to ask is, can our library be called an institution? Our title today is called Reimagining Institution. Right. And what makes an institution? If we have built all this kind of contents or so can is it uh, can our project be called a legitimate institution or what if it can't? Because it's merely created by a bunch of graduate students. Who can create an institution? Can uh, can people like us who are basically Chinese graduate students simply form an institution? Or does it have to be created by old professors, prestigious scholars, or so on? Does it have to go through all the process we are going through today in the English academia? All the, all the grants, all the projects, all the funding, all the anything about publication, about jobs. Does, does an institution have to have all of that? Well, that's my question for today. So with our, uh, with the website technology we are talking about, we plan to add several features based on AI and blockchain technology into our library to make it a more interesting institution, hopefully, than the current UK academia. For example, how about we turn system gaming into actual system gaming? We have seen on the map that our map is designed to be to have an entrance and have an adventure route. And with ChatGPT, which Lu had shown us earlier, we are able to create interactive fictions. In other words, create a text adventure game with it. Imagine if you read the process of reading an article, the process of being in being lead into an area can be a game which you have a conversation with some uh, with some NPC, some character, and gradually get to know about this. There are already some AI research tools, as I mentioned at the bottom left, called Elixir, for example, which allows you to ask research questions and they 
give you the links of relevant research papers. And we already got the chat GPT's, uh, GPT 4's API, and we plan to do something about that. So now, as you can, as you can see, our inf infrastructure so far is still supported by the Web2 technology, Zotero, Notion, Omeka, and uh, Wix, which compared to what supports the Cambridge University, maybe something pretty cheap, actually, which is also one of our themes called cheap digital humanities. We believe that the web technology empowers everybody or empowers by the way, students even like us to create some institutions and imagine institutions that suit their own needs. And we have a, uh, and toward Web 3.0, our new vision is not only build our website on this, but also towards a new infrastructure, which might center what we call DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. We're not going into details here, but I would just invite you to imagine it. For example, all the uh, all the references, the Dr. Life references we have been using, exporting, citing every day, can they function as tokens? Token is what we exchange every day, right? For example, in academia conversations, in citations, that's basically the medium of exchange. Then how about we use this medium of exchange to make money, right? Imagine if references can function as tokens and libraries can be banks and our citations can be transactions and learning can be gaming as we have shown with the GPT infrastructure and the research can be called mining, the environmental friendly one as, uh, as Yu Xing has been argued. And how about our, our funding doesn't come from applications or the prestigious founders, but come from investors and the cryptocurrency, which is based on our reference system. Imagine if you can make money simply by knowing and sharing, by exchanging references with others instead of by system gaming and competitive publishing. I'm not saying that we can achieve that, but it's just something for us to imagine today. And can this kind of infrastructure invite back the excluded ones in our academia today? For example, those outside the institutional networks, those who have knowledge but stuck at applications, or those who prefer reading or doing to writing, those invisible and inaudible in the white male dominated conversations, and those people who are systematically disadvantaged in academia. If we build an in institutions which is decentralized autonomous organization, could they solve this kind of problems? Of course, those problems should be solved regardless of Web 2 and Web 3. And what, ha what we have presented here today is basically a vision that allows us to imagine and shows what this, what this kind of technology allows us to imagine in this new area. Thank you. And please follow our Twitter and our website. Now I will stop share the screen and we will enter the Q&A. Everybody, you are allowed to turn your camera on and unmute yourself. So now, oh, I have already seen a question which is answered. It's about data justice. And whether ChatGPT has something to do with colonial studies. And here is Lu's answer. We can read it uh, later. And here we have another open question by Scott, uh, by Scott Kerr. Thank you. I discovered this library through Zotero a while ago and subscribed. I had assumed that some of the library creation was automatic using later techniques. But did I hear correctly that it's all created manually? Could you talk more about the creation, please? Okay, I can take that. So all the library um, collection, as you can see, the library contains two things, right, in the third world, the classification system and the content in it. For the classi 
classification system, it always has to be designed manually. I have been, I think I have spent like two months just thinking about the classification system. I mean, which item, uh, how many categories should there be and how should I categorize it? And uh, that's where that's where we are. And for the, mm, and for the actual entries in there, some of them are indeed created automatically. You may know that there are different kind of plugins that allows you to automatically import things, for example, from Oxford bibliographies, from different catalogs, for example, Evo or so directly into the library. And if you set it, set it up, they can basically be directed into the correct categories. Um, alongside the classification system. So yeah, it's basically half manually, half automatically, this library. Are there any other questions? If there aren't any, uh, maybe Yu Xin. Actually, I think the question about uh, uh, ChatGPT and uh, data justice and uh, colonial studies may also be for you because your research has been covering this project. Maybe you like to talk a bit more. Uh, yeah. Oh, here is the question. Yeah, it's in the. Click to the answer. Like? Yeah. Can you see it? It's in the Q and A panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Cause the um, yeah, the infrastructure that support the work of the Web three of the crypto world is also located on the frontiers and hinterlands of the, in China and in in other places. So I guess maybe it's also some uh, heritage of the colonialism because these places, they are located in the frontiers of both physical world and the digital world. So it's due um, an uh, unevil structure of exploitation because um, those people who actually work in the crypto mining factories, they have no idea about what these things are for. So yeah, I think so. I think these people who in the underdevelopment areas, they provide labor and resources for the system, uh, but they cannot benefit from it. Yeah, it is what I want to explore in the future. Yeah. And also the, the second one. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think maybe yeah. It's just a. It seems the same because it's something that seems to be automatically functioned, but actually it's um, it's done by manual labor. Uh, yeah, I think the AI is pretending human, and somehow our work has become as more like AI's work. We are also imitating. Uh, AI, when we done this, when we when we done this work, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. Here's a new yeah. question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I have all, I have seen uh, Jim's question about uh, is there, is there a difficulty with ChatGPT that it reinforces existing historical categories, many of which are barely outdated in the history of science. Yeah, I believe we can maybe talk about it all together. Yes, definitely. ChatGPT has a lot of pro problems, right? Like what Lu has been talking about. For example, it may reinforce a racial, racial injustice. It may discriminate some people and it may use outdated data I have tried to put my PhD research, research question into the chat box and it tells uh, us about nothing correctly, which is what happens. But still it can be 
I think the uh the way uh, out of it is how we can how we apply this technology. For example, I have shown that there are already software that allows ChatGPT to simply give links to uh research papers if you type in the question without without making up an answer itself. And if we are designing a game, we may be using similar functions. If we guide guide ChatGPT through our research library and make it this way that it can only answer questions from uh, by providing links by pro and by using data that we have and we ourselves um, has been very has verified that might be a way out and now the APIs can they can already do that there are many ways to limit what ChatGPT can do and limit what it does and I believe there are already uh, many examples lying around. And Lou, do you have anything more to say about it? Uh, I think I think it's it's part part partly correct in that people are processing and responding to what is happening now based on some existing ideas and experiences. But maybe it also shows that a lot of things need to be reimagined in terms of how we approach and deal with them. Yes, but um, the details maybe I can't I can't respond to right now. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Uh are there any more questions? If there isn't any, or I believe it's probably typing could take some typing could take some time. So yeah, I don't see more questions uh, in the chat, but if you want, you can always connect us with our you know, history of science Twitter, which is still under development. But uh, doubtlessly, all of us have access to the Twitter account and we can uh, always answer any of your, your queries or you can try to email us, that's also fine. I think it's they're already running a long panel today, and I'm very grateful for all of us, for all our panelists who are joining and our audience who have been staying with us and have been interested in our panel. Thank you very much. So I think it's the time to wrap up. And thank you very much, Sam and Alexander as well. And thank you for the Vintage Society for the History of Science for giving us the opportunity to present at the digital festival.